Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio, our Saga 960. Well, that was a fascinating discussion with uh, a union leader uh, in regards to security workers. And now we're going to be joined by uh, management. Uh, Paul uh, Katrinetchuk, is that right, Paul? Close enough. Katrinetchuk. Katrinetchuk is president at Synergy Protection Group, a Toronto-based security firm that says his workforce has been overlooked. The work of security guards puts them in direct contact with the public. They can't remove remotely. They can't work remotely, and uh, they should be essential workers, and they're not. Paul, tell me, what is the issue? Well, I mean, as you as you articulated, it's absolutely uh, we're an, we're an essential service. Uh, we're protecting the properties uh, that are doing the testing. We're protecting the properties that are doing the. Uh, vaccinations. We're protecting your grocery stores, your uh, your retailers that you frequent and shop uh, throughout the entire pandemic, right? And it's been very challenging because as frontline workers, and I'm not taking away from you know traditional frontline workers of the doctors, the nurses, police force, absolutely, um, absolutely not doing that. Uh, however, uh, we play a role. Security has always played a role, uh, and now we're brought from the foreground, sorry, from the background to the foreground, and it's been really challenging over this past year navigating that, uh, seeing the challenges with the labor force, seeing the challenges with uh, the changes in regulations. And um, it's a difficult time to operate any business, let alone a security business. And give me a sense uh, versus, uh, you know, police forces, how big is uh, the security business in, in Ontario? Uh, there's over 800 agencies, licensed agencies in Ontario. I think last time I checked, there's about 60,000 uh, licensed guards in Ontario. 60,000 licensed security guards in Ontario. And how would that compare to police? Do you have any idea? Actually, I don't know that number. I, know I was police. told that there are four security guards for every one police person. Is that at all reasonable? Sounds about accurate. Absolutely. We're a lot more places that uh, police are not, for sure. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I was in a hospital just today and the security guards were at the front door, um, um, you know, making sure that people were going to see the, the, the intake people that were screening them for, uh, for COVID. And uh, at, the, at the vaccination center, uh, they were, there were security guards there. There there's security guards in all those places that one would think about as being reasonably high risk. Absolutely. And since pandemic, it's, it's triple fold, right? So normally you would, at a hospital, absolutely have um, security. At a grocery store, maybe at a high risk location, uh, at a mall for sure, but now you're seeing it at a lot more places. You're seeing it at the entrance, an additional security uh, guard there directing traffic. Um, they're doing line control, they're doing um, social distancing. Construction sites is another uh, pretty big one. Warehousing is another big one where uh, now they have to do COVID screening. So that is our role and the responsibility to make sure the employees come in, check in, do the temperature scan, whether it's on a computer, um, thermal optics on a, on a camera, regardless of how it's done, uh, there's still security there manning that and making sure uh, that the people are checking in. And if someone's not willing to, uh, um, you know, uh, maintain social distancing, physical distancing, wear a mask, etc., it's often the security guard that has to implement whatever the business's rules are. Is that not the case? Absolutely. And you have, uh, you've had a, a change over the last, I'd say, seven months where Traditionally, it was a really enforced the mask policy. We're seeing a lot of places uh, because they don't want to be under scrutiny uh, or I guess uh, they don't want to see the outcomes on social media. They'd rather just say, hey, you know what, if they have a medical exemption, let them have a medical exemption and they'll just push through and, and let their team members handle it instead of security. Because security naturally brings an element of enforcement into it as opposed to maybe a team member from the store, team member from the hospital, that sort of thing, come by and say, hey, excuse me, can I speak to you? And pull them aside and, and speak to them uh, on a different level. Uh, people tend to think that security is a lot more into enforcement. Instead of having that conversation with us, uh, they're pulling it to the, store, uh, to the store member or the retailer. Now, my understanding is that uh, Premier Doug Ford uh, and the provincial government at one point in time had suggested or promised maybe in fact, that uh, security guards would be deemed essential workers um, and would get uh, to the front of the line for vaccines and, and treated as essential workers and it didn't happen. Why not? Well, I, I wouldn't want to be uh, a leader of any kind of a province or the country at this point in time. It's a really challenging time to be at 
It's unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this in our generation, in your generation, and we've had smaller outbreaks, but not to this scale. Uh, we're living in a global village. Everything's impacted from uh, supply chain overseas uh, to local economy in Northern Ontario. Everything's impacted. So it's, it's challenging. You're trying to triage it. You're trying to take the best data you get and have at the time and make decisions on that. So uh, no matter how you stand on the political spectrum, it's still a challenging decision to make. And for whatever reason, we were overlooked. Why? Why were you overlooked? Can't say. There's other priorities, other places, I guess. Uh, Long-term care was a big one, right? That was, uh, that was a, a tragic tragedy that happened there. And that probably, if, you know, again, hindsight's easy to go back to, but if given another opportunity, you know, obviously the government would look a lot closer at that and stemming that infection there quicker. But you take a look at a lot of the... Uh... The criticisms of long-term care and why it ended up being a problem is because you had uh, contract workers that were working um, uh, at numerous different uh, long-term care facilities that got infected somewhere and ended up taking uh, um, the, the the infection from one place to another place to another place. Well, isn't that the same with the security guards? Do security guards go from place to place or do they tend to be at the same place all the time, full-time? It depends. There's a lot that stay in the same place at the same time for years. Uh, and then there's a lot that move around. Uh, but unfortunately, it's it's that service economy that we're in, right? You see that a lot. You see that, I mean, you can speak to the same thing with Uber drivers, Skip drivers, um, all these kind of different um, turnkey industries where it's a lot of people moving around, different jobs, different households, even Instacart, where you're ordering your groceries, you're trying to be safe at home. Um, you have a person that's doing that for 50 different households every day, right? There's transmission possibilities there as well. So there's 60 to 80,000 security guards in Ontario. That's amazing. How many, what, what type of training do they get? Uh, so the province has legislated um, back a few years, a 40 hour minimum course that they have to take and pass before they can uh, take a test to get their security license. Uh, that also includes first aid and CPR. And that's hours, so one week. The one week, and that's basically it. So companies like us that value our team and our employees, uh, we put in a lot of additional training and COVID's, uh, COVID's helped to that. So we've put in additional training on how to deal with aggressive customers, how to deal with masking policies, how to deal with line queuing, how to stay safe in their work environment, right? And that's different. We have a mix of commercial, condominiums, retail, uh, mobile. So we had to look at our training packages, really reinvent them to make sure that uh, the employees can stay safe. If I was hiring a uh, bouncer, I would know sort of the physique that I was looking for. If I was hiring a police uh, officer, I think that you've got a fair amount of uh, education training um, and uh, physical uh, fitness and things like that that they have to uh, pass. What kind of uh, criteria do you have for the hiring of a security officer? Hmm. It's hard to answer. Um, in today's day and age, uh, we really don't have a we don't have a choice. We have to go on uh, what the role is, what we're looking for in the role. So whether it's a tactical position would require um, industry experience, would require different certification like use of force, handcuffing and batoning training, that sort of thing. Uh, tactical communication, de-escalation. Uh, if it's a regular security guard, again, it depends on the environment that they're working at. We've seen people with no industry experience excel really well in retail. We've seen people with no industry experience excel really well in condominiums or other environments. So it really depends on the situation. A lot of times people can be trained uh, to meet your expectations, but we can't discriminate against any size or, or any kind of um, whether, again, we're going to a higher risk location, we can't turn down someone because their physique isn't strong enough. We have to make sure they're capable to do the job. And through the training and certification, that's where we'll find people that can't get the use of force certification because they can't put the right moves on people. They can't use a baton effectively or detain a suspect effectively. And therefore, they wouldn't have an opportunity to work at those locations. What's a use of force certification? Uh, use of force is a, a use of force is a theory that's taught uh, to OPP and police forces across Canada, and that's basically a, a model of force that you use to mirror other people's uh, or your, I guess, your suspects' 
um, whoever you're engaging with, I should say, uh, what they're doing. So if, if that gives a, a police officer reasonable grounds to um, use their firearms, use their baton, if the person is pulling out a knife, that is escalating into the next level where there's uh, life endangerment, right? So that allows that police officer or security guard to use their baton to disable that person, right? So it's kind of- uh, Go ahead. No, that's, that's okay. The security guards get use of force training? They do, yes. And uh, they don't carry guns, but are you suggesting they carry handcuffs and uh, batons? They do carry handcuffs and batons. And they're trained, uh, they're trained on how to use those properly. And, and when would they use handcuffs? Uh, well, so in our loss prevention uh, team, we have lots of private, uh, sorry, loss prevention investigators who go out and um, their, their job is to catch shoplifters. Those shoplifters a lot of times don't come uh, back to the store to get arrested without using handcuffs. So they have to be physically detained until and police arrive. you have the right to detain them using handcuffs? We do, yes. And that's if you have this use of force certificate or any security guard? Use of force training, correct. Uh, well, any, I should uh, be careful here because <laughs> technically anybody can arrest someone, right, under uh, Chapter 494 of the Criminal Code. So we have the right to arrest someone. It's just like if you see someone stealing a purse or something, you have the right to detain them. Uh, whether or not using cuffs is a different story. So no, you can't use cuffs as a civilian, but if you have proper training, you can use handcuffs. So if I have the right to arrest someone, but I can't use cuffs, wh what am I allowed to do? Lock them in a room? Touch them on the shoulder and detain them. That's all you need to do is detain them, right? You just have to touch them and say, I'm taking away your right to leave this premise. Okay, but that's not going to detain a lot of people and they're going to just leave. Correct. So that's where the handcuffs come in. Okay. Um, you said de-escalation was one of the things they're trained in. Tell me about that. Well, our first priority as, um, I mean, police force, um, private security is de-escalation, right? We want to de-escalate the situation first. We never really want to use cuffs. We never really want to use batons. Um, so we we are trained in de-escalating situations to make sure that uh, we can get the person to cooperate with us uh, without any violence or any use of force. How do you de-escalate? Depends on the situation. Uh, it's just like us having a conversation and we don't agree on something, right? I may use different tactics in my speech, how I speak to someone, my body language. Uh, there's many different tactics to de-escalate a situation. And all security guards are trained in de-escalation or just uh, some that are in these high-risk situations? So um, conflict resolution is kind of a baseline training for us. We make sure that that's covered extensively in the training because at any time they can be in a conflict, whether it's a, a guarded condominium, a concierge over a parking spot uh, that two tenants are fighting over or a um, stressful situation with packages or just a mental health situation uh, during a pandemic where people are a little bit a little bit out of their mind right now with all the lockdown measures, right? So yes, conflict resolution is trained. De-escalation uh, with the use of force model is trained for tactical security guards and people that are in a position of higher risk. Gosh, listen to you. I think we should all take uh, conflict resolution courses and uh, de-escalation courses. Sounds like it'd be really helpful sometimes. Absolutely. It works well in life. You know, it's interesting because uh, certainly during the race riots, uh, uh, and, and the defund police and all those things that happened last year. We heard a lot about uh, how uh, police forces um, really had to deal with a lot of mental health issues and a lot of, uh, of uh, psychiatric problems uh, that uh, really called more for de-escalation uh, than for necessarily use of force. Um, I uh, interviewed a uh, psychologist that told me that 70% of the people in our penal system had mental health problems. I, I would absolutely agree with that. I, w I found that astounding to think. And so that almost suggests that their violent behavior or whatever it was that got them uh, put in prison was not necessarily a choice. It was because of something messed up in their, their brain um, uh, from a mental health issue. Uh, and that maybe some other kind of solution would have been better. So, you know, what this suggests is that security guards have got a pretty tough job. They do. Absolutely. Um, it is a challenging job and it's, it's exaggerated by the challenges of the pandemic, for sure. There's no question. So why shouldn't they have been, maybe not at the front of the line, but close to the front of the line in getting vaccines? 
other pri I would imagine other priorities. I, I mean, I can't speak to it. I hope that uh, our counterpart on the union had some uh, insightful information on that. Uh, I'm not high enough within the, uh, I guess, the food chain and the political spectrum to get any real information. Um, but it's challenging. We're all kind of working towards a goal. Everyone's got a voice. Everyone's got a lobby, right? So uh, different lobby groups are working their angles and stuff like that. And it, it's challenging. But again, um, we are seeing some traction. We're seeing more doses, uh, more shots in the arms. So that's really good, really positive. And hopefully we can get through this. Do you think you're going to put in place uh, rules uh, in the future that if you're not vaccinated, you can't work as a security guard? That'll be interesting. Um, we've kind of mulled over some of that uh, discussion at the office here, and it would be interesting to see. Uh, most likely there will be something like that put in place, not in general security, but I think in specialized areas. Like high risk situations or high hospitals? Risk, or Hospitals, that sort of thing, where you're more prone or even long term long-term care centers, we're more prone to getting something or giving something to someone that could be detrimental. We're chatting tonight with Paul Katrinichuk, president of Synergy Protection Group, a Toronto-based security firm um, that uh, has security guards that he says has been overlooked in regards to being declared an essential service during uh, the most recent pandemic. Um, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio or Saga 960. We're talking tonight about security guards. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I didn't know a lot about uh, this issue and and how how large the security guard force was. Uh, I've had estimates of between 60 uh, to 80,000 people, uh, somewhere around four times as many security guards as police officers in Ontario. Um, and uh, we've spoken to uh, earlier in the show, a union representative, and we're now uh, chatting with uh, Paul Katrin and Chuck. Is that right? Katrina Chuck? Katrina Chuck. Katrina Chuck. Uh, and he's president of a Synergy Protection Group, a Toronto-based security firm. You've also got operations in Ottawa, I, I understand. Um, and, um, and, you know, both the union and uh, management are arguing that security guards have been overlooked. Um, Paul, you know, has it been challenging running a security guard company during COVID-19? Absolutely. Um, like any business, very challenging. Uh, for the most part, it's it's difficult because of the changing regulations. So we have many customers that open up, close up because of the different uh, lockdown measures. So that means we're hiring, rehiring, training, retraining. Uh, people get laid off and they get back to work. Uh, next part of it is is the overall labor market. It's a, it's a challenging business to be in. People are at times scared to go out to work. Um, they hear a lot of stuff. I mean, first wave was relatively easy. Um, security force was eager to work. Uh, understood some of the risk and challenges, very cautious on PPE, uh, social distancing, proper guidelines. Uh, second wave, really didn't feel anything because we've kind of lived with it for six, seven months. Third wave, uh, guard forces across Ontario started to feel the hit of guards getting sick, um, having exposures, or not necessarily themselves, but just roommates or family members within their household. So they're off for 14 days automatically. You have a runny nose, can't come to work, 14 days or a test. So that, when you have someone that's trained specifically for a location, that adds a lot of challenges to managing your labor, right? Especially when you can't operate normally. You can't have interviews like we used to. You can't have group training sessions and that sort of thing. So you really have to manage your resources right. You have to pivot where you can pivot and, and make sure that um, that guard, when they go out in the world, that they feel comfortable doing what they're doing feel that they have the necessary skills and training to do that work and um, and stay safe, even in their social life. I spoke to somebody, uh, I spoke to someone uh, just a week ago that uh, left their job. And it was interesting because they said they were hired a year and a bit ago um, and they left their job. And they said during that whole more than a year, they'd never met in real life one of their coworkers. And that was one of the problems is they, you know, couldn't develop uh, uh, a group feel, a connection, uh, got, didn't get good training, didn't get mentorship, et cetera. It was all through video. Yeah. And you can learn to mentor and guide and, and have social experience, uh, social uh, engagement with your team. Uh, and we've let, definitely learned to do that. We have a lot of fun online and uh, sometimes it's a bit silly, sometimes it's serious, but it's great for employee engagement for sure. Like we just had the fourth Be With You Day 
So a lot of the guys uh, dressed up in their in their gear to pitchers and stuff like that, and we kind of did the best you know best outfit wins kind of thing. So you got to find you got to find the way. You gotta keep send me some pictures. Possible. That sounds fun. Um, <laughs> what about technology? Uh, you know, with um, uh, remote monitoring, Internet of Things, drones. Has the security business changed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, biggest part is like we've gotten involved in remote video monitoring the last couple of years. Uh, we're getting pretty big in the space. Uh, it's a great service to add. We, um, I mean, we monitor cameras all across Canada, and uh, you know our ops team here they filter the alarms. They they voice caution uh, would be or potential threats uh, from customers' properties, and that could be from uh, plazas and parking lots uh, to retail environments. Uh, to, um, uh, well, I just lost my train of thought, sorry, uh, to construction sites. And uh, we find that over the last decade, we've probably lost as an industry to physical security, we've lost 90% of coverage. And normally or traditionally, uh, construction companies would have a guard overnight, uh, typically to watch their site, mandated by insurance. Uh, but over the last decade, it's been more cost effective to have cameras set up. And that's what we do. So we set up cameras, we monitor for intrusion, theft, uh, access control, that sort of thing. And it's it's great because the customers get uh, satisfaction. The guard, the cameras never go to sleep. Uh, they never go for coffee, uh, right? So they're always on. They're always available. And uh, it's you know it's a truly truly great service to add to our organization. So when the opportunity, well, I can understand how the cameras and remote monitoring makes sense for you. But what about the guards? Is this going to be negative to their employment in the future? It depends. Um, with the way things are going, different verticals open up, different opportunities open up. So I think there has been a shift in a certain market, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't say not a systemic thing across the industry. But we have to be understanding that robots, uh, well, I should say the, the general idea of a guard somewhere will be taken over by a robot eventually. The general idea of a guard is going to be taken over by a robot eventually. So we're going to have a whole bunch of robots. So you're going to be in the robot business. We're going to be in the robot business. Um, now, I want, you, I want you to understand they're not going to be necessarily an enforcement tool, but they're going to be an, a critical information relay tool, right? So they're going to have, I mean, you've seen some of the bots that they have in San Francisco roaming and stuff like that. Boston Dynamics, their dog, that's around, that's, uh, I think, a $80,000 investment, if I'm not mistaken, and the price is going down. And that dog, you can put on a site that you would have a personal walk and just let it go. It's built in with all sorts of sensors, cameras, and relaying that data back to you. Um, it, it's, it's remarkable. It's unbelievable. So we will see that. It won't, there'll still be a need for security to do enforcement. There'll still be a need for police or security engagement. But on locations where you'd have maybe a, for example, a mall, you might have a, um, a customer service dro a robot, if you will, um, for lack of a better word. And uh, that'll be able to give you critical information. It'll be able to roll through with uh, analytics on the cameras. That'll be able to feed back to you and let you know if there's any banned suspects or persons that's wanted by the police uh, rolling through the property. Um, so there's a lot of exciting technology coming up that's going to be integrated into our everyday lives. I was in a plaza in front of an office building a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was a person who probably had some mental health issues that was yelling and screaming obscenities at a bunch of the people that were in that uh, outdoor plaza. And uh, two security guards uh, came up and did an incredibly uh, good job of, of uh, calming the person down and walking them off uh, the property. They actually called the police. Uh, the police arrived after the person had left. So the police could not have done the job, but at least they were uh, notified in case uh, anything had escalated. I can't imagine a robot being able to do that successfully. No, not at all. And that's where the engagement still needs to happen, right? Um, that's great to hear those stories because a lot of times you hear the negative stories, but it's great to hear um, our guys in the field encounter mental health issues all the time. And it's about that de-escalation. It's about understanding that this person is is not healthy right now. Right. And they're not gonna they're not gonna be reasonable. Uh, there's no need to amp up the situation or, or you know, take it any further. Just calm them down, relax a little bit, take them back and walk them, escort them off the property. 
Paul Katnerchuk, uh, president of Synergy Protection Group, uh, Toronto-based security firm. Thanks for joining us tonight and telling us a little bit about the challenge security guards and security guard businesses have uh, during COVID-19 and uh, this issue that they uh, wanted to and were promised to be declared an essential service, get vaccinated uh, near the front of the line, and that hasn't happened. Um, but also interesting hearing about uh, about use of force, about uh, about de-escalation, and about uh, technology uh, and how it's changing your business. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you very much. Take care. Well, that's our show for tonight. Hope uh, you enjoyed uh, listening to these two gentlemen. Um, I come to you every Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and video casts are available after the fact on my website, briancrombie.com, or on uh, YouTube for the video and on uh, Apple Podcasts, Audible, uh, Speak, uh, Speakeasy, and a whole bunch of other uh, podcast uh, vehicles. If you're at all interested, please listen, watch, and share. Thanks. Good night, everybody.